Hello there, and welcome to Speaking of Our Words, programming that brings you the wide range of voices, stories, and forms of local writers, and offering you some insight into their creative process. My name is Chris DeGuire. I teach creative writing workshops at Columbia College Chicago, and I am your host. We, will, we have several guests here today, uh, all open mic today, so why don't we get going? Our first reader is going to be Walter Gascoigne. Hello, Walter. Hi, Chris. Walter, what do you have for us today? Uh, it's a short story that um, turned out completely different than what I had imagined, but maybe that's what I had imagined. It's similar to inventing. Um, probably how most inventions are made, they're not realized until actually they're done using it and getting it, and then they realize at the end, hey, this is what it is. And that's kind of how this piece uh, turned out. I had no title and I had no last line for this until I read through, reread through the piece and figured out what I was really trying to say. All right, well, Walter Gascoigne, take it away. Uh, it's called Dreams of Christmas Future, Coping with Shopping Blues. Holy night, silent night, my ass, thought Sergeant Anders. Bombs were exploding in the distance. Small arms fire and screaming accompanied them. Sergeant Anders was awaiting the word to begin the push in one of the many bunkers that strung out along the beach like beads on a rosary. The military had chosen Christmas Eve for the attack knowing what message this would send to the enemy. As he looked around in the dim candlelit surroundings, he could barely make out the faces of his men. Most were new to his unit. They looked scared, like frightened rabbits caught in the headlights. He caught a glimpse of Private Higgins, who was sweating profusely, even though it was negative 10 degrees in the bunker. That guy's a dead man, thought Sergeant Anders. He had seen it before. Guys like Higgins never lasted long. There was a pile of dog tags to prove it. A plane flew overhead, and a few minutes later, explosions could be heard. His platoon had landed on the beaches of Nome, Alaska over a week ago, and had made little to no progress making their way into the interior. The enemy was entrenched in the heart of the city, and the only way to take it back was through the use of infantry. The bombings were only being used to soften up key positions before the big push came. This would be the third attempt at trying to take the city. The first two times ended in disaster. The enemy had placed landmines in the roads leading into town, effectively blocking the pass that the armored vehicles needed to use to reach the inside of the town. Personnel carriers and tanks now dotted the landscape. Their burned-out husks reminded Anders of chestnuts his mother used to cook during the holidays. She would lay them on the porch railing to cool, steam escaping upwards into the cold night. Sergeant Anders was lucky enough to have survived the first two attempts. He did not think he could survive the third. He vividly remembered the second push into the city. It had been a furious clash. Troops were battling for every square inch of land. Door to door and street by street, Sergeant Anders and his men fought with bravery and cunning. They were outnumbered and outgunned, but through sheer determination and many casualties, they slowly advanced into the heart of the city. When they reached what could be called the town square, the fighting grew less and a stillness hung about the air. It was then that their courage waned. When they saw what made even the hardest of men tremble, their faces turned pale, and more than one man doubled over to vomit into the blood-soaked streets. The enemy had taken the bodies of women and children and, like grotesque ornaments, had hung them from the telephone cables. They were disemboweled, and Christmas lights had been strung throughout their bodies, twinkling on and off, making the dried blood turn from red to black. By the look on the dead people's faces, they must have been alive when the torture had occurred. While the men were in shock, the enemy surged forward like thousands of angry ants, swarming over the entire regiment, decimating all but a few. Sergeant Anders was one of the lucky ones who made it back, but not without scars, both inside and out. Who would have thought an attack would ever come from the North Pole? What government would be capable of building a base large enough to launch an attack on seven different countries on three different continents? The assaults came so fast that very little footage of the attackers was available. What little was studied showed hundreds of thousands of troops, their eyes glowing in incandescent yellow and fangs dripping with blood of their victims. They wore bright green and red uniforms with pointed helmets that had the skull and crossbones symbols engraved on them in gold. They butchered their way through helpless cities as unsuspecting people were killed in their sleep. No doubt dreams of sugar plums in their heads, said Anders to himself. Their weapons of choice were flamethrowers, which spewed liquid death and burnt all in its path, turning people into silhouettes of burning bushes. 
Nothing was ever filmed of their leader. He was very cautious as to not place himself on the front line. He was used to keeping a low profile until the day he was needed. Anders knew that would change tonight. Christmas was his day after all, wasn't it? He would make those little bastards pay. Those little scumbag, low-life motherfucking bastards. He would make every one of them little fucking elves pay with their lives. And when he got through with them, he'd find Father Christmas and shove a stocking full of grenades right up his ass. <clears throat> the doors finally opened as Anders double-checked his Christmas list and he was swept along with the mob of people into the department store. Walter Gascoigne, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words, and next up is Darlene Coleman. Hello, Darlene. Hi, Chris. Darlene, tell us a little bit about what you have for us today. I have a short story, second uh, second version. Uh, I tweaked the ending. I'm not quite sure if this is the final version or not. All right, very good. Darlene Coleman, take it away. <clears throat> okay, this is called The Game. Mr. Bernard was a short, balding man, easily 70, with a distinctive air about him. He was well-heeled, well-educated, and spoke eloquently. He usually bore, wore brown, well-tailored suits with the same pair of well-worn but always freshly shined wingtips. He had a way of gracefully slouching in his chair during board meetings, hands perpetually resting on his face or up on top of his head, even as he spoke. His carefully crafted sentences, often complete paragraphs without a single uh or um, hung in the air like ornate brocade draperies. So entranced by the aesthetics of his articulation were the other board members that they frequently couldn't remember a single thing he'd said. Although he'd never spoken to me, I secretly considered Mr. Bernard my mentor and tried to emulate his air of sophistication, understated elegance, attention to detail. I imagined people eager to shake my hand, ask my opinion, regard me in the same worshipful manner as they did Mr. Bernard. Sitting on the board was a heady experience, especially considering my being selected was a fluke. Arthur P. Hall was supposed to have been on the Wilkshire board because he was born to such things. It was expected of the exceedingly wealthy, requisite as water polo or fox hunting. Arthur sat, in fact, on several charitable boards. He lent his name, if not his attention, to organizations specializing in the care and feeding of the downtrodden, the drunk, the despairing among us. If he hadn't had the bad fortune to have appeased his wife one time too many with another cruise, I would not in a million years find myself in the same room with Mr. Bernard. As it happened, the entire crew and cruisers on board that ill-fated ship were either dead of legionnaires or so ill they wished they were. Even money can't save a person in all circumstances. And so it came to be that I found myself in a lemon-scented, gleaming boardroom surrounded by huge tropical plants and abstract paintings in Arthur P. Hall's cigar-colored col leather swivel chair, sitting ramrod straight, ankles crossed, index fingers tented together, with what I hoped was an inquisitive, engaged expression on my face. Mr. Bernard sat three chairs over to my right, but because the conference table was an elongated oval of thick glass, and because he was positioned at the curved end, I was in position to observe him quite well. Deep into the meeting, I found myself copying every nuance, each gesture. Mr. Bernard raised a brow. I raised a brow. He cleared his throat. I cleared my throat. As a motion was being seconded, Mr. Bernard looked straight at me. I shifted in my seat placed my left hand on the table and returned his gaze. He shifted in his seat and placed his right hand on the table. An unspoken elaborate game ensued between us, and although he didn't look directly at me again, he mirrored my every move. When the meeting was adjourned, I expected him to linger. I envisioned approaching him with my hand outstretched. I thought surely he'd smile and acknowledge our private little game or perhaps even jokingly admonish me for instigating it. Instead, he stood, pushed in his chair, and left the room without a word. I was caught off guard. I barely had the presence of mind to get up and follow him out into the hallway. I saw him enter the men's room, and I hesitated, but only briefly, before I too entered. Only one stall door was closed. I stood in the next stall. He coughed softly. I followed suit. His toilet flushed. 
mine flushed. Our little game continued. We washed our hands side by side. Then he spoke. Young man, what do you bring to this board? Mr. Bernard, sir, I extended my freshly air-dried hand. I'm Jack Owen. I didn't ask your name, he said calmly without any trace of anger or annoyance. I asked what you brought to this board. Uh, I'm here representing Stratton and Hall, sir. I'm the replacement for Mr. Hall. He's on medical leave. I stopped and looked at him in the eye. But I'm sure you're aware of all that, I smiled. I am aware of a great many things, young man. I would like an answer to my question. What do you bring to this board? I straightened my shoulders and stood evenly on both feet. I bring enthusiasm, sir, ideas. I bring fresh, new perspective, dedication. I bring dedication and a good work ethic. I can't tell you how pleased I am to finally meet you, Mr. Bernard. Ah, but we haven't met. I never make acquaintances in restrooms. You could have introduced yourself in the boardroom, yet you did not. So much for enthusiasm. You did not say a word at the meeting. So much for new ideas. You mimicked my every move. So much for your fresh, new perspective. Exactly what would you say you are dedicated to? Mr. Bernard turned briskly and walked out the door without waiting for my answer. I waited a few minutes before leaving. The hallway was empty. It had not been, after all, a game to him. I had read him wrong. I was nearly out of breath as I ran across the parking lot. Please wait, Mr. Bernard. I heard a car door slam and an engine start up. I saw the brake lights on a dark green sedan with tinted windows as it backed slowly out of a parking space. I ran towards the car, waving my hands. The car kept moving. I turned, ran for my Jeep, gunned it, and drove after Mr. Bernard. At the first stoplight, his left turn signal went on, and I was able to pull into the turning lane two cars behind him. There was oncoming traffic, and I had to wait until the light was yellow to turn. I thought for sure I'd lost him, but then I saw the dark-windowed sedan up ahead. By the second stoplight, I caught up. I was right behind him. We drove in tandem for a quarter mile or so. My eyes were glued to his taillights. He turned right down a narrow, one-way street. The block was run down, full of old houses with boarded-up windows and missing shingles, stacks of old tires, busted furniture strewn about the yards. This can't be where he lives, I thought. Just as his car door swung open, I yelled through my open window, Please, forgive me, Mr. Bernard. I've a, I've a lot to offer this board. Give me another chance. Let me prove myself. I didn't mean to mimic you. I thought we were playing a little game. My mistake. Your mistake, all right, buddy, said the man walking towards me with a tire iron. But this is no game, dude. The tire iron came crashing down on the Jeep's front fender. I reached for the window control. If you shut that window, I'll smash it in your face, too. I drew my hand back and looked at his face. Oh, my God, you're, you're not. I didn't mean to follow you. I, I thought you were someone else. Get out of the car. Now. I ain't playing, dude. I thought about flooring it. Maybe he wouldn't follow. Instead, I opened the car door and slowly got out. He stood with his feet shoulder-width apart, a doughy man whose gut hung over grimy work pants. He stood there as if surprised I had done what he'd asked and gotten out of the car. When I slowly reached my right hand up to loosen my tie, he flinched. I did my best to channel Mr. Bernard. I cocked my chin, narrowed my eyes, and bellowed, "'Do you know who I am, sir?' I half expected him to laugh, but he just stood there. I continued, What do you propose we do about this situation? This was a case of mistaken identity. I offered you an apology, and you, sir, severely damaged my car and threatened my life. Those are felonious charges. You are aware of that, are you not? The man shook his head as he stepped backwards. You're funky nuts, dude. He tossed the tire iron into his car, got in, slammed the door, and peeled off. The transformation was complete. I was Mr. Bernard. I smiled into my rearview mirror. I'll show you what I bring to the board. Game on. Darlene Coleman, thank you very much. All right, next up is going to be Jeff Sturch. Hello, Jeff. How are you doing, Chris? Pretty good, pretty good. Jeff, tell us a little bit about what you have today. Well, I brought uh, some poetry, uh, a few from a collection of a uh, poetry book I'm assembling called You're Not an Angel. 
and uh, I brought four today. So, All right, very good. Jeff Sturch, take it away. Okay. Um, this first one is called The Kiss. A kiss, two steps, I am closer. I am underneath her once distant breath now. I feel like summer and alive. Yet my eyes slip away, unlike you would see in a fairy tale. The beating of my heart flew wildly, much like children play freely. She lifts my chin slow, gentle, and her smile lines greet this rare shyness. And for what seems like days, I see myself inside her eyes, happy to be her secret muse. Flowers dipped in sugar is her taste. Soft, plush, and moist is her warmth. New Year's in September, and I feel drunk. I lost my words within a rare heavenly kiss. Waves of kisses roll in, each one just as beautiful as the first. I wanted to stay there, right there, just to let this passion rise and fall and rise for her kiss. This next one is called Sleepless Poetry. It's been a while since I felt like this. I stayed awake to see this morning sky's amber kiss. These silver stars, they dangle like puppets on a string. For a moment, I, I believe this was my stage and my heart began to sing. It began to sing. Morning sounds accidentally filtered in. Silhouette trees all huddled together like the best of friends. I look, arise, look around realizing I was the only one here. And to my surprise, it was just me and the chill in the air. Sleepless poetry has me dreaming again. This page I script just seems to skip words along. Maybe I'm just a poetic man that's tired of being alone in a song. A familiar song that seems to always time its way in. I'd sing along, but my voice is modest. And I think my voice is the only one sleeping in. I start yet another prayers over that someone that I have not met. Only a vision of a possible companion, a morning idea that has also not slept. Sleepless poetry has me dreaming again. I find my heart happy in this place, though still, still I feel stranded on top of my own personal Ferris wheel. This above the trees sweeping wind, it's still whispering to me. In subtitles, they answer, but only in prayer, softly among the breeze. It's a long way for a kiss to blow, if you ask me. Who really cares if all I need is one final heart to pour mine into, fast or slow? That's just me. Sleepless poetry has me dreaming again. This next one's called Weary Words. It is in the way that a lonely tree's empty swing glides. And if you close your eyes and listen closely, you can love the voice that a whisper hides. It is in the way that a promise assures you that it understands. The remains of trust is all that you have. The undying truth and the shared kiss an endless smile that somehow has found its end. It is in the way that a heart feels that it cannot stay anymore. In all those moments that never really wanted to carry tears this far. An invisible kiss was teetering on the many waves racing to a shore. It is in the way that a melody shares its way with weary words. It is a leaf that cannot bear another windfall and for what feels like a pending life that mentions how it feels awkward, but yet her memory still stays now, just for that season somehow, among weary words. And this last one uh, is titled, Never Good at Goodbyes. I painted myself into another position, standing right in, in a stormy disposition Will it ever go away? Will it ever stay? Will it ever become a part of me, a heart, 
a perfect consistency. You know, I was never good at goodbyes. I thought to myself that you'd be coming back this way, someday, somehow. Could someone tell her that I, I just couldn't wait? Yesterday's thought that no one could ever get inside. I hide the truth, damn this face that shows the proof that I was never good at goodbyes. Something, something would have been nice to hear. Tangled, intricate, intricate measures, my dear. You pre prepared me for the worst. Damn this life's landslide. I slid into this learning curve. But today I ran too far until I ran to this parallel. Yesterday I would have called it a living hell. Again, I was never good at goodbyes. It's funny. I've washed away just about everything. Still at times your memory rushes right in. Maybe I should have washed my mind. I should have known better, and yes, better should have known. Known somehow how to sidestep all of this. Cope with this. I was never good at goodbyes. My great fate of necessities. I think I've perished in these thoughts. I've questioned my sensitivity, and the rest will just wander along. Does opportunity ever knock for the second time? I suppose I just have to be good to myself, and maybe I'll find that there is a place for everything, and we'll just have to have the patience. It still remains that everyone should try, yet still, it's never good at goodbyes. Jeff Sturge, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words. And our next reader is going to be Jim Janis. Hello, Jim. Hi, Chris. Jim, tell us a little bit about what you have for us today. Uh, just a short story. This is uh, kind of in draft phase right now, a little prototype um, based very loosely on A Christmas Carol. <laughs> All right, very good. Jim Janis, take it away. The prisoner looked up through the blackness to the deep blue beyond the rectangular opening of the brick wall and out to the pinpoints of stars that shimmered through the crisp, frozen air, which had no choice but to enter his cell. Through the opening, the hard silence was softened by a faint, continuing sound, distant singing, a combination of young boys' and young girls' voices. The prisoner could not tell the words, but from the sweet melody, he sensed hope. The thick metal door opened and closed with a bang. Get up! It's time again for the machine. The prisoner shivered. Please, sir, I beg you, let's take this night off. How dare you talk to me like that? The jailer rattled his key in the iron box attached to the bars. But tonight? What about tonight? The jailer grabbed the prisoner by the arm and walked him to the shining metal table on wheels. Sit. It's your Christmas Eve, sir. How dare you mention something of my religion? Lie down. There's a similar day in my religion, sir. Stop talking. Give me your left arm. And the jailer pulled the leather strap, securing the prisoner's arm to the gurney. Do you know the Dickens story, A Christmas Carol? You mean Scrooge? Give me your right arm. Yes, in a way, you are like the Ebenezer. He was a businessman and a miser. I'm neither. Give me your left leg. Ebenezer had a heart, a very capable heart. And I think you too, sir, are able to feel, to love. The prisoner's boldness angered the jailer. Don't talk to me about the ability to love. You brought death to my country, the greatest country in the world. Give me your right leg. Your great country considers one innocent until proof of guilt. For a citizen, you, you're not a citizen. You're an enemy combatant. Lift your head. The jailer placed a metal ring above the prisoner's ears. Even for an enemy combatant, sir, your country prefers to have proof. That's exactly why I bring you to this machine every day. The jailer connected a number of long, coiled wires between the machine, the metal ring, and parts of the prisoner. The prisoner challenged, This machine somehow produces proof? It's supposed to make you talk. I know you have information you're not telling me. 
On the metal front of the machine, the jailer flipped the switch and the word ready appeared in dark gray on a light gray background. A number of dark LEDs on the panel blazed green. On the first day, I told you everything I know. You told me nothing. Maybe you're beating it. From the top of the machine, the jailer picked up a paper-bound manual and began to leaf through the pages. The prisoner continued, I assure you, sir, your machine cannot be beat. We've trained some of our agents, subjected them to a number of techniques, so that if captured, they do not reveal anything. The jailer's attention was drawn to a particular page in the manual. The prisoner challenged, So you too have secrets? Perhaps secrets from your own citizens? The jailer became angry again. Look, this isn't a child's world. There's real bad guys out there, cowards who want to destroy our peace. Our citizens want protection, but few want the dirtiness of the job. And when you flip that switch and the electricity vibrates in infinite, jagged, needle-like waves through each of my nerves and my brain becomes an electrical storm, you're protecting your country? Shut up! Listen through the window. Listen to their voices. Tonight, it is a child's world. Can't we take the night off? Can't we, Ebenezer, sir? The prisoner turned his head to the side and strained to look up through the window to the deep blue beyond the rectangular opening of the brick wall and out to the pinpoints of stars that shimmered through the crisp, frozen air. And the children's voices continued forever. That also reminds me a little bit of In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with that story. Yeah. Jim Janis, thank you very much. All right, our next reader is going to be Jim Payne. Hello, Jim. Hi, you, Chris. Jim, tell us a little bit about what you have for us today. This is a little different because it's not fiction. It has to do with a real incident that happened in Kenosha last month where a father brutally murdered his 11-month-old daughter and beat up his wife trying to defend her. And so it doesn't actually, their fi characters are not fiction, the names are real, the places are the incident, because it's also intended not just as a story for the reader, but for the audience to be able to try and grasp of how such a tragedy could happen. Yeah. All right, Jim Payne, take it away. This is about the horror of human destruction, about harm, pain, and suffering, and about how mental illness destroyed the lives of three people as they knew it. But it's also about how strength, support, and compassion can light the way out of the dark void that a violence and insanity and fear can lead us into. I have physically touched each of these three people, and they have touched my life forever. The first person is Russell Rose. He is a tall, handsome man, always wearing a fashionable fedora. He sings in his church choir, addresses his congregation about his marvelous life, and I attended church with him. He and April Lamprey were in love, almost married, and 11 months ago she gave birth to the love of her life, Serenity. Russell was excited about his daughter and played with her, and she giggled and smiled, as did April when he would pick her up and hug her. For a while, his church and his family life were secret refuges for him. Because of being so confident about himself, no one knew that he feared something inside himself. But some wondered if he were for real. In a class, Russell spoke about his future. There was an eerie, lilted tone and a strange look in his eye like he was seeing a unicorn. He told us, I'll be a millionaire now. It was clear he expected just that to happen to him soon. He was barely earning a living now. We, we couldn't comment. His claim was too strange. There are many of us who have suffered at some time from emotional struggles that threaten to overwhelm us. But there are only a few who are psychotic, and only a few of them ever break down and need special help to keep from exploding. Russell Rose was one of them. Russell's idyllic, grandiose future was slowly breaking apart. Pieces weren't turning out like he thought. 
His daughter Serenity would run away from him. For her, it was a play game. For Russell, it was a survival game that he was losing. Inside of him, broken pieces were tearing him apart. The torment became an evil force that could destroy Serenity. He had to save her. There was only one way. He had to get rid of April and destroy Serenity before the evil consumed her. He had to act. In a vicious attack, he beat April when she wouldn't leave and tried to shield Serenity. Then grabbing Serenity, he lifted her over his head and smashed her to the ground and beat her. The little child's scream was heard by a neighbor who was able to get April out of the house, but it was too late for Serenity. She lay on the floor, twisted in death. The raging inferno inside Russell burst out, and he set fire to the house. When the police arrived, seeing the disfigured Serenity, they cried. They caught Russell, who stopped raging, but his rampage left death and bruising on others. He was destroyed inside and for life. The district attorney is asking for a prison sentence of 70 years plus life. If Russell could, he would commit suicide. How do we know when friends need mental help? How do we get mental help to them in time to ward off destruction? We can't deliver all that is needed, but we can increase our compassion for their suffering and, and offer helping hands, one person at a time, to those who need psychological support. Two nights later, I visited April in her hospital room. She looked at me, sad and hurting but alert. I was drawn to the appealing look on her bruised face and reached out gently to touch her arm. Immediately, she pulled back and firmly but gently, Please don't touch me, that hurts. I looked down at the arm I had touched. It was bruised black in large blotches from her wrist to her shoulder. She lifted it, and I saw more horrible damage under her arm, all the way up to her armpit. She was sitting, propped up in bed in her hospital gown, holding an ice pack on her other damaged hand, two fingers nearly bitten off. But her eyes told me to stay. She wanted, needed, caring people. After her eyes sincerely welcomed me, I looked around the room for the first time. April wasn't alone. There were six smiling people now talking to her, and she was responding to them slowly but gladly, in spite of her pain. She was listening and talking to them. Her loving mother and father had been sitting with her for two days and nights. There were four other relatives, two from Ohio, keeping up a conversation with her, almost chatty, as they also adjusted to her tragedy. They were a family, each speaking randomly, some joking, commenting on each other's thoughts, but mostly about April's tragedy. Looking at her eyes, darkened with bruises and grief, I commented that she must be sad and that it would last a long time, a very long time. She kept looking at me and said slowly but with acceptance, I know. April was starting to own her fears and grieving. I was amazed by her courage. It will take a lot of time and tears, but April is a brave lady. I better realized how strong a person April is when one of her family ventured that maybe there could be one good thing that can come out of this tragedy. Maybe what April has suffered can alert other women to leave before being hurt. She firmly said, Yes, I hope other women learn from my experience to leave a dangerous relationship. And the next day on Facebook, 
Under pictures of her bruised and swollen face, she wrote, These are the facts. Just want to say, if you are in an abused relationship, please get out. She has a lot of courage, and we all can learn from her. Looking at me, she saw the question in my mind, Why hadn't you gotten out? She faced me, cradled her arm as if holding serenity, and looking down at her, then said, I saw how my daughter loved her father, and I couldn't take her away from him. In some way, she owned her part, perhaps traveling on a circuitous path, but I realize she will recover. The family chatter continued to support April, and she joined in, but it was getting late, approaching 10 o'clock, and time for her pain meds so she could sleep. I wondered what would happen tomorrow, and asked April, where will you live when they discharge you? Before April could answer, her mother leaned forward with her arms reaching for April and said with a happy, loving smile, she will come and live with us. April was a 27-year-old young woman who had gone through the normal hassle to leave her parents' home and go on her own. Now she had to go back. She looked at her mother, her eyes accepting her loving invite, and said with a little twinkle, My mom never really cut the umbilical cord. We all laughed, for April had a home. It was leaving time, and I went over, careful not to touch her arm, and kissed April on the forehead. She looked up at me, and her eyes showed she was appreciating everything we were doing to support her. It was time, and I left. The following day on Facebook, April posted many smiling, happy pictures of serenity and her together. Under them she wrote, I may not be perfect, but when I look at my daughter, I know that I did something perfect in my life. She also wrote, My beautiful baby, I love and miss your sweet and sassy voice, and you are blowing me kisses from across the room. I miss you when you do something good, and you automatically start clapping, waiting for me to clap and say, Yes, my big girl. I love you so much, my precious angel. I am always with you. Forever love, your mommy. My beautiful baby, I miss you so much. I'm still feeling the horror in my gut from seeing April's brutal beating. I still feel her sadness pumping through my heart, her forever loss of her beautiful, sweet, fun-loving, rosy-cheeked daughter, Serenity. My feelings will fade in time like a crease in my trousers, but I will always remember April's courage and the compassion of her family supporting her. Even in the horror of the loss of a child, we can reach out with compassion and touch those who have been hurt and those who have harmed. Sometimes it is only when we touch such horror that compassion so deepens into a forever living memory. Jim Payne, yeah, thank you very much. All right, I am going to read uh, the next piece. Uh, this is a first draft excerpt from my uh, worst summer job novel in progress. Uh, the two characters here are Jason, 17, and Sarah, 19. Uh, to sort of sum this up, uh, about a year before the novel begins, Jason's brother Michael was killed in a car accident. Uh, Sarah was Michael's girlfriend, and she was pregnant with Michael's baby. She's only told Michael and her parents, and that's a secret that is kept through uh, the whole book. Uh, and after Michael's funeral, Sarah disappears, and Jason runs into her in the opening scene of the book. Uh, another character whose name pops up in this draft, her name is Courtney. She is dating Jason, and all of them work in a grocery store. Uh, this scene 
Uh, this is New Year's Eve, 1999. It is one of the last scenes in the book. Jason is grilling steaks in a garage where there's a New Year's Eve party going on. And uh, Sarah, after again disappearing around Thanksgiving uh, without telling anybody, has returned. And her and Jason are alone out in the garage. So you disappear for like a month and you don't tell me anything or say goodbye again and you just show up here and you don't want me to be mad at you? Sarah half smiled and sat down on the couch under the fogged up window as some smoke from the grill swirled into the room. I wanted to tell you, she thought. I really did. I wish I could tell you everything. Instead, she just answered, I'm sorry, and she knew it didn't sound right. She held her head up, but her eyes gazed down at her legs. I'm sure, Jason replied, lip flinching, as he went back out to the grill, flipping open the lid and inspecting the stakes. Smoke billowed, and he couldn't quite see them, but he knew they weren't anywhere near ready. He wanted to tell her how angry he was with her, because it felt exactly like it did over a year ago. Maybe Mom and Dad were right all along. Maybe Sarah wasn't worth it, and the worst thing that could have happened was running into her at the store. But deep down, he didn't believe that. He closed the grill and fiddled with some of the utensils on the side extension before going back into the garage and into the side room, sitting on one of the tall swivel chairs, arms on the armrests, facing Sarah. Are you even coming back to the store? he asked. He watched her clasp her hands in her lap and added, I heard that you had just taken a leave of, I have a daughter, she said quietly. So quietly, Jason almost didn't hear it. But he did. He stopped, mouth clamped shut, eyes shifting back and forth as if he didn't understand. A daughter, he asked, face scrunching up. You have a niece, she said a little louder feeling the weight of that secret fall away like melting butter, the smoke from the grill just enough to warm her chilled face. You're an uncle. Jason slid back a little, legs stretching out to the floor, and ran a hand through his hair, frowning. How was this possible? I almost told you that night, she said, shifting. The night I caught you, you know. I remember the night, he said quickly looking up at her. That explained a lot. They sat silent for a few moments, Sarah watching Jason swivel slowly, looking down at the floor. I wanted to tell you more that night, she thought. I wanted to tell you that I had feelings for you, that I still do, and that I blew it. But she kept silent, feeling her insides coil around her heart like an anaconda. She wanted to get up and kiss him, to tell him she loved him, was in love with him then and now, but she knew she couldn't. It wouldn't be fair. Courtney was a nice girl. Did Michael know? Jason stopped swiveling and looked at her. He felt an urge to go over to her, but a stronger force kept him in the chair. Yes. She shook herself from her own thoughts. Yes, he did. I told him that same night, right before I came upstairs. He didn't take it well. No. She clasped her hands again and crossed her legs. It didn't feel as warm anymore, even though the stakes sizzled furiously outside. Do my parents know? He hoped that would explain even more. I didn't tell them. My parents begged me to tell you guys, but I didn't even tell them until a month after the funeral. Why do you think your parents know? I don't know. It would explain a lot more. Do you think your parents told mine? I told them not to, that I would do it eventually. When, he wanted to ask. Then he shrugged. That might also explain a lot to my parents, why Michael started drinking. Your brother wasn't a drinker, and he wasn't drunk the night of the accident. Jason frowned at her. But I thought, yeah, I guess legally he was drunk. He'd only had two beers, though. But I guess between the news and the crowd he'd fallen with? I don't know. What do you mean? 
He'd been making a lot of bad choices. One was his friends, some of the guys from the team. They were a bad influence on him, and I didn't like it. I almost broke up with him. Jason sat up, scratching his chin. This was too much, way too much. What's her name? Lisa. Jason cracked a smile. Is she cute? Adorable. I'm sure. Can I meet her? I want you to, Jason, yes. Soon? Yes, but that's kind of the reason I've been gone. She got real sick last month. She's okay, but I needed time off. Time to think about things. Yeah, I need to process too. Like, a lot. And that's where this draft stops. All right, so our last piece today is going to be by Richard Bell. Richard Bell cannot be here with us today, so Lisa Adamowitz Kless is going to read Rich's piece. And I do believe this is a piece that we heard on our last show, but I know this is a Christmas piece, and seeing as how is the time of this recording that Christmas is less than a week away, uh, I believe this is a, an appropriate uh, Richard Bell story. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, Lisa. Hello. All right. So you've got the story of our rich. Take it away. All right. So this is titled Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Sure, there are a lot of Christmas stories about Santa, but I've always wondered, where did Rudolph get his red nose from? So I did a little research and discovered the following theories. Some claim that when he was young, he was helping to put up the Christmas lights at the North Pole, and he slipped and fell off the ladder, ladder head first into a box of multicolored lights, and a really big red one got jammed up his nose. The reason it glows is because of all the radiation that comes from the sun and gets concentrated at the poles due to some weird magnetic field that only a few people really understand. Santa and the surgeons tried to remove the bulb from his nose, but discovered it went in very deep, and taking it out would risk permanent brain damage. Another theory is that his mother smoked a lot before he was born, which caused a strange mutation. So Rudolph is really a mutant and would qualify for the X-Men if there were an animal X-Men. Rudolph can control the brightness and see in the dark by infrared light, and could also make it bright enough to blind you if he wanted to. It makes him kind of dangerous, I think. There is another theory which simply states that one day he accidentally stepped on a live wire and got jolted with a few thousand volts of electricity, which fried his nose and crystallized the blood vessels, causing it to turn red. It only gets bright when he is angry, so to guide Santa's sleigh, they have to make him really mad. That would explain why, just before Christmas, they laugh and call him names, and don't let him join in any reindeer games, which we learn about the song from which we learn about the song about him. Now it's not so mysterious, is it? They have a good reason, and he gets so mad that Santa has to intervene at the last minute, so there's enough glow left to guide the sleigh, but so Rudolph doesn't murder all the other reindeer while they're asleep. The elves put Rudolph on a suicide watch at that time. Finally, there's a theory that during the off-season, Rudolph and his family lived at Chernobyl in Russia, where they had that terrible nuclear accident. But that would not explain why his nose was red beforehand, so we can rule that out. We can also be glad that he is not referred to as Rudolph the Brown-Nosed Reindeer, which would be more of a social commentary. There is no indication that his nose was ever any other color but red. Then again, maybe he's been a communist all this time. Merry Christmas, comrade! All right, Lisa Adam was class. Thank you very much. Okay, so every now and then at the end of the show, we have a little bit of time to discuss some sort of writerly topic. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how we as writers choose to reveal information, whether that information is secrets that characters have from one another and when that gets revealed to either the characters or the audience or how we uh, introduce stories or sometimes in the case of nonfiction or creative nonfiction, how you, we, how we as writers introduce the piece. Um, and even in poetry, sometimes how you decide what line is going to come first, or if you're going to open with an image or, um, or what you feel the piece may be, maybe about that sort of thing. So this idea about the choices we make, um, either in the beginnings, uh, as the stories move forward, uh, how these choices might differ from project to project. Um, we're going to talk to all of our readers today, and you know, feel free to talk about specific pieces. You can talk about the piece that you read today, um, or you can talk about your process in general, this idea of how you reveal information. I know, speaking from my standpoint, a lot of the stories that I write, um, I'm interested in, in secrets that that people keep from one another, particular families who, who don't tell other family members very important things. And with this particular piece that I'm working on, this idea of when to reveal 
when uh, Sarah was pregnant. And it's sort of hinted at a lot, you know, in the first draft here. And, you know, I'm debating whether or not I want the audience to know that up front or if I want the audience to realize it at the very end here when the character of Jason understands it. And, you know, in, in first drafts, you know, these things, we're always playing around with these things and trying to figure out where they fit, you know, and then thinking in terms of our audience. So, um, but I'm interested in how you guys also uh, deal with this. And Walter, why don't we start out with you? Um, you know, like I said, feel free to talk about this project or any other project you got, but how do you, how do you choose to reveal the information in your story? Um, it's, uh, like Richard Bell said last night at the meeting, um, it's good to start with an idea, but as, as I come up with the idea, I want to find a way to hide that idea to the end. Uh, most of my stories are Twilight Zone-ish in nature, Richard Matheson kind of stuff. So I, I try to, um, like you said, string the audience along so they're unaware until the very last line usually or last paragraph of what's actually happening. Um, almost all my stories are like that, except a couple of the uh, um, true to life stories. But um, almost all my fictions like that. And sometimes, like the story today that I wrote, I I surprised myself that I didn't know exactly that's what it was going to be until I actually went back and looked at it again and said, "Yeah, wait a minute. This isn't about a guy killing elves. This is about a guy who hates shopping and hates Christmas." And and, and I saw that when I stepped back from it. Otherwise, it still would have been a story just about a bunch of elves getting. I think it's fun as a, a writer to be surprised by these things that come up in, in dress, especially when you let um, a piece or a project sit for some time. You know, as you start to think about, you know, what these stories are about. That's one of these things that I'm always talking about with my students. You have this 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 thing about what hap what's happening, the, the physical activity and action of a story, but then un underneath it all, it's all these things that the story is about, and it's usually about several different things, and it's usually a lot different than just, you know, overall themes of the story, you know. Um, but it's always, I, I, I believe, also pleasantly surprised by, by things like that. Um, Jim Payne, uh, and in particular, you know, with, with the nonfiction piece that you, with, that you read today and how you introduced it, but, you know, again, feel free to talk about this piece or overall in general, how it is that, that you reveal information in your projects. Well, that to me, the, the theme that you mentioned in your case of the secrets that people keep from each other, and my tendency is to, to ser search into the secrets that I keep from myself, that we keep mm. from ourselves, yeah, interesting. and how, how that keeps us from doing something or leads us towards doing something. And the thing is, as a writer, that puts me in a position where, and anybody else as a writer, where you're getting to have to maybe know a little more about yourself than you wanted to know. Because you, you're letting sort of your subconscious roll out and things you didn't expect, like you were talking about, Walter. Things will just come up from your subconscious that you don't know. But if you stay with them, you begin to unravel things. And so it becomes sometimes scary, too. In contrast to the piece that I read today, where that was about real people and real situations, real quotations, real experiences. And I didn't have to worry about uh, personal secrets. But when I'm writing a story that I'm fictionalizing, fictionalizing it or just writing a story, I like to get into the secrets that people are discovering or experiencing or avoiding in themselves. And the secrets is a big thing. Yeah, I know. I'm also very interested in what makes people tick, you know. And I think all, I mean, all of us keep secrets from ourselves and from other people and sometimes they're really big and sometimes they're not you know really anything at all so that's interesting interesting jim jim janice how how is it that you go about revealing information in your in your work yeah so uh my piece today was pretty short so there wasn't a whole lot of information to be revealed but the way i put that together was i started uh, strictly with um with dialogue uh, had the two characters talking and i knew i wanted that machine that kind of torture machine in there um, so first I put the dialogue together and then just kind of as a technique I decided to work in in order to try to keep the character engaged or the reader engaged because um, even myself I can become disengaged if I'm seeing too much dialogue going on and not some sort of action or visual. Um, so that's where I was layer layering in kind of those descriptions of the guy getting his arm strapped down and then the, the other arm. Um, 
but it was through the conversation I think where kind of more information was coming out and then in those physical movements and then um, uh, you start seeing the machine getting connected so instead of kind of putting all that stuff up in the front of the story and loading it um, I, th- I thought I did an okay job on this initial draft of gradually revealing that info. Mm-hmm. And you, you talked about this idea of uh, audience as well. I mean, how, how aware are you of audience when, you, when you've got this story going on and you realize you've got these layers to it, you know, whether it's with character or with story that you're sort of peeling away at, you know, getting to the core of what it's about. How, how aware are you of the audience at, at those points? Yeah, so I'm very aware, you know, so the first test is myself. Even, even though I'm writing something, I can – very often I write something that's not even engaging or interesting to myself. So I first need to get it to, to reach that bar of holding my own attention. And then I want to keep in mind the audience and, like I said, make sure I've got enough in there to keep them interested. Uh, this one, be, it was interesting because uh, when I referenced Christmas Carol, you know, Dickens built that story in a very specific way to make the story work. There's a reason for Marley. There's a reason for the ghosts. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to do something with current events. You look at somebody like Dick Cheney, who's, you know, very set on on his views. So I wanted to say, hey, what if we took a character like that? Is there a way you could put him in Scrooge's point of view and get that guy to go mm-hmm. through a transformation? Um, I haven't done that yet. I don't know if there is a way to get a character like that to go through transformation. I didn't want to in- introduce ghosts. So this was really like my initial prototype to try to play around with that idea. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then, Jeff, I know you mainly write poetry, but I mean, how is it that you make these choices uh, and how you're revealing information, whether it's getting you know an image to the page or revealing or talking about what your writing is about? Well, for me, um, I'm kind of a people watcher, motion watcher. Um, and when it comes down to... Uh, expressing that uh, I try to use a really detailed like emotional I let it sit in me for a little while like a melting pot of me and um, I dig deep for like an emotional descriptive view because I always plan on there being a reader for what I'm writing and so like I choose to use you know elements like seasons as in as in a form of love or uh wind doubling as a dance when you see a dress move or a hair move or a ribbon come undone from from a, a, a mother or a daughter's hair. Um, so I try to really give a view, visual descriptive view um, and bring them in close and in hopes that uh, it's something they needed from the inside that I can actually do inside. Mm-hmm. Um, so I um, in, in my in my book that I'm assembling, uh, You're Not an Angel, um, I do write a, a author's reflection to where I was, with the different sort of point I'd, um, I was getting from it, not to change what they're going to get from it when they read read it, but um, just to, for that inside the writer's mind, because sometimes people just want to know that. I think that's one of the interesting things, too, about this this medium, if you want to call it that, of, of writing and getting the thoughts of ourselves and of our characters on the page it's a lot different than you know what a movie or a television show can do you know this idea of revealing what is going through a character's mind you know like with in 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 my case here with this with this with this girl who was pregnant and and gave birth i've been debating on whether or not i want to follow her point of view through the whole story because if if i do it's going to have to come out very early that she's pregnant and you know, I, I just wonder if that's, you know, something I want the audience to know or if I just want the audience to think about it. You know, I'm just, I'm just not quite sure. So everything, you know, is in a draft process. So still trying to figure things out. Darlene, how is it that you reveal information? How, how do you get to this stuff? That's interesting. It's interesting um, you're talking about secrets because I think that my characters keep secrets from me. <laughs> and um, I usually start a piece with... I just have a kind of a visual sketch of a character and they slowly, when I start writing, they slowly reveal themselves to me and Mm -hmm. I almost never know where my stories are going or what's going to happen or what's going to come out in the process. Um, So it's, 
it's as much a mystery for me as, as it would be <laughs> for the reader. I know that uh, th- that happens to me a lot, too, and that sounds very similar to something that uh, Walter was talking about and, and something that Walter was talking about at our at our group meeting last night, this idea of how sometimes the story knows more than we know, you know, particularly when you start peeling away these layers. So, Lisa, how is it that, that you get to revealing information in your in your work? Well, for me, it really differs because right now I do a lot of nonfiction, um, you know, just by virtue of the different projects and, and things I'm involved in. So, um, you know, for that, for example, I just did an interview last month and I'll be doing another interview um, for the next article I'm working on. So, I mean, for that, the whole purpose is to reveal information, you know, but again, you have to do it in a measured way so that it's it's still interesting. Yeah. But um, I am working on a short story, I'm working on it for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, with that, I'm having, you know, a little bit of a challenge because with that, I really want to be careful in how I'm revealing the information that um, I think it's going to be really important that sort of the secrets or the surprises of the story are being revealed in a really specific sort of measured way. So, uh, so yeah, that's going to be a little bit of a challenge to to kind of switch it up from doing the nonfiction to, to doing this and trying to, like I said, be really sure that I'm, I'm revealing it in just the right time. Yeah, yeah. There's this idea of uh, promises you make to the readers on the, uh, on the very first page. You know, sometimes even in that very first paragraph, and even in this, uh, in in writing nonfiction, you're still, you're still telling a story. I think you know, and and you True. still got to figure out well, where am I going to start this? You exactly. Know? Um, and sometimes the things that we start writing, or where we think the beginning might be, once you get further and further into a draft, this is just you know based on on on, on my experience and uh, other experiences that um, even though that's where you're starting the writing, that may not be where the story actually begins. Sometimes the story begins 50 pages later, or sometimes you need to go back a few pages to start the story. Well, thank you guys very much for your insight. Uh, This is a very interesting topic, I think. So thank you very much to, again, all of our guests today, Walter Gascoigne, uh, Darlene Coleman, uh, Jeff Sturch, Jim Janis, Jim Payne, Lisa Admowitz-Kless, and Richard Bell. If you have any questions or comments or wish to participate on this program, please visit the KenoshaWritersGuild.com and come to one of our meetings. So, Lisa, you are the president of the Kenosha Writers oh, Guild. If, if someone would like to <laughs> join the Kenosha Writers Guild, what do they need to do? Well, I would just welcome them to come join us at a meeting um, at Carthage in the Hedberg Library. And uh, we meet every second Thursday of the month for workshops, guest speakers, um, in-depth critique sessions, panel discussions, and those are all free and open to the public. And then we meet the third Thursday of every month for our main meeting where you can bring in work and read aloud, share with the group, and get some feedback and critique um, for that. And those are also free and open to the public. So like I said, I would just welcome someone to come on down and join us for a meeting and see what we're all about. All right, very good. Thank you very much. And again, visit the website, KenoshaWritersGuild.com. Please feel free to leave any comments on the Facebook page for this show, Speaking of Our Words, or on the YouTube page. Thank you very much to Dave Cole and WGTD, Steve Brown, Nita Hunter, Troy McDonald, Lisa Adamowitz kless and the Kenosha Writers Guild. Thank you all for listening. This is Chris DeGuire, and the world needs your stories. We will see you again. Thank you.